Hi, I'm Gary Nall. I'd like to welcome you once again to our Classroom on the Air series. Today, I'm going to talk about something that may seem extremely esoteric, but listen to it. It came to me in one of my, what I call my special moments. You've had special moments. We all have special moments. These special moments mean that we're coming to an understanding of something that hitherto for, but suddenly it's like an epiphany. We have we have an insight. We have a better understanding of something that we may have been struggling with and not understood. It's like the gestalt. You have an answer before you knew there was a question. And I've had these. I wish I had them more frequently, but these become the basis of whole new teachings that I work on. And then I simply ask, if it's not reasonable, what I'm saying, if it doesn't make sense, don't use it. If it does, then it might be able to help you. I'm going to give some examples, not to in any way brag. I don't do that. But rather to use myself as an example because I've lived it. I remember once struggling so hard to get my inventions accepted. I didn't think about the money. I came from a poor working class family. But one thing I did have that maybe seemed a little strange to my friends they accepted me. You know, Gary, Gary's a little... <laughs> Gary's, Gary's somewhere else sometimes. We're not sure where that is. But that was because I invented things. By the age of 14, I had over 150 inventions. These inventions were realistic. The highway flashing safety sign around curves, meaning there was a road in West Virginia, Route 50, from Clarksburg to Parkersburg. And that's where the most accidents happened. Because when you're going around a curve in a two, two lane highway, and you can't see who's on the other side, if someone's not paying attention, boom, you wreck. So I thought, my dad says, this is a dangerous, you know, we were driving back and he says, this is a dangerous, a bunch of uh, curves here. So I thought right in that second, because these things come to me like instantly, why don't we have a, a flashing sign that when you go over tripwire on this side of the road, it turns on that sign. And when they're coming on this side, they can't see over here, but they go over tripwire and suddenly you see a flashing sign, slow down, car approaching on opposite sides. And then after they run over the tripwire on the opposite side, it turns it off. Okay, so I went about uh, building a little model of it tested it, and then took it down to the state road. I wrote him a letter, and they responded. The commissioner of the state road, I still had the letter. And uh, I went down, I took a Greyhound bus down to Charleston, West Virginia State Capitol. And I spent about an hour showing him all this, and he had some people come in. He had an engineer from the state come in. And they actually, I don't know if they were patronizing me or not. I was just a kid. But they said, this is really interesting. But then... Uh, I also invented the electric fabric measure. I was in a store with my mom and she was buying some fabric and I watched the person make a cut and then with her two hands, you know, rip the fabric. But when she was finished, she had to cut it off because part of it, because it ripped at an angle. So right then and there, I thought, okay, what if they have a little, uh, a little machine that you put the roll of fabric in and you turn the knob to how much you want, two yards, three yards, and then it measured that out and automatically a razor comes across and cuts it so you save all that fabric. So I made the machine and, I, and, and my basement. And uh, then I contacted the Measure Graph Corporation and they invited me out. Once again, I, I took a bus out there, couldn't afford a plane. And I, and I got there a little uh, late because of the bus and they had already closed for the day, so I had no place to stay. So I just stayed in the bus station with my little invention beside me. And the next morning, I went in and brushed my teeth and, and went over and showed it to them. They, they said it was really good. It would save a lot of, it would save millions of dollars a year in all the fabric stores. But anyhow, I'm just giving you a few examples. Um, then uh, a Dr. Carson at uh, Pittsburgh Steel had a whole group of scientists come in because I had invented a way of taking the uh, 
uh, the hard particulate matters that were magnetized out of steel mills that were causing all the pollution. Why? Because one day I came out living in Weirton, West Virginia um, after college and the it just snowed and the whole lawn was filled with red sparkle-like stuff. And this was all pollutants from the steel mills. You couldn't, you could wash your car and 10 minutes later, it had this soot on it. Now, needless to say, we didn't even know at that time how bad that was for our health. So I made up uh, this catalytic uh, trap and I took it up and I showed it to them. And again, they agreed. It was a good idea. And and I don't believe that they were patronized. I believe they were telling the truth. Anyhow, I did all this stuff. I was also designing fashions and uh, as, as a hobby. And so my mind would not stop. I would sit in class and just look out the window, daydream about creating something, but it was always creating something for a problem or thinking of a solution for a problem. That's how my mind works. It doesn't turn off. Um, and that's why I've been, I believe in part successful helping people because of looking at a different approach. Because if they've gone to the best hospitals and they've gone to the best doctors and everyone's done the best they can and they haven't helped them, they failed. If I did the same thing, I'd end up failing. So I take a different approach and where possible, I end up succeeding. In any case, jump ahead. So I had all these letters that all said, good idea, uh, but we're going to pass on it. Now, it turns out, and I won't go through this, some of the places where I sent my ideas would later do those same ideas, but I didn't get any credit for it because I didn't even have enough money to file a patent. I didn't even know what a patent was. I just knew I could create something that would solve a problem. So that was frustrating. So finally, I wrote a little book on it, a little tiny book called uh, Turning Ideas into Dollars. But telling people what I did that they shouldn't so get a representative, get your patent, be protected, and let a marketing company sell it for you. I didn't know any of that. I'm a kid. What do I know? I'm lucky to be able to spell my own name. So, and then I started to see how having no money, living below the poverty level in New York City when I first arrived with $12 off Greyhound bus, and that was sold that night when I was washing up in, in the uh, bus station room and I sat on a rock right across the street from the uh, Plaza Hotel where there's a party going on. And all night I heard this song, What's New Pussycat by Tom Jones. And I thought, well, tomorrow morning I can call my mom. She'll send me uh, up a Western Union. I can get a bus and go home. Or I can stay here and see maybe this is a place where people are more open to people who have original ideas. And I stayed, and I'm thankful I did because I found, I found a plethora of individuals who were equal or exceeded me in their creativity. And that's always fun. Remember, you always get faster when you're chasing the rabbit. The rabbit is a term, a metaphor for the fastest runner. You don't get faster going behind the slowest runner. You have to challenge yourself and our heroes, the, the people we respect, uh, the people who are doing something we think is just really marvelous and unique and wonderful when we're young, uh, that motivates us, that inspires us. And uh, so anyhow, now we come full force. So I have a book and it's going nowhere. It took me two years to write the book and I was given $500 True story, I still have the check. I was paid $250 a year, $500 to write a book on health. And I did that and I studied, became a registered dietitian, so I had no more about nutrition. And uh, in any case, when the book came out and I went on, a, they, they were gonna send me on a little tour, four cities down the East Coast, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Washington, D.C., uh, and I think Allentown, uh, Pennsylvania. And that was it. And they expected to sell somewhere between 100 
to 200 copies of the book in hardback. One of America's greatest authors was there at the same time. And he was a legend. I had actually interviewed him on my radio show, Writer's Forum, which I did every day. I interviewed the greatest minds I could find coming on to talk about not fiction, but nonfiction. The exception was Pearl Buck from West Virginia. Uh, and in any case, no one came. Now, I'm behind him, waiting for him to finish. And they had a little stand with a pen, and you'd sign someone's book. And like three people came. And yet he was alleged to have sold over 100 million books. He was top-selling author in America. The word was his and others. In any case, I went over to him. I said, sir, I said, I, I'm, I feel sorry I'm, that you're such a great author and nobody shows up. He said, hey, kid, he said, don't worry about it. He says, I wouldn't go on these tours because I know no one's going to show up. Why should they? They can turn on television now and watch Mike Douglas, Merv Griffin, Johnny Carson, and all the people who want to sell books go on there. That's where you sell your books. You don't sell them here with book signing parties because we're inundated with celebrities. We become a celebrity culture. And so authors are not considered with rare exception, celebrities. They're well known, respected, but it's like the people, the average person doesn't know how to relate with someone who's very intellectual and very heady and like Kurt Vonnegut. I mean, who wants to have a conversation with Kurt Vonnegut? He said this, and I'd interviewed Kurt Vonnegut several times, brilliant man. And so I, I heard what he was saying, but I thought there's gotta be a solution. And so, no, of course, nobody showed up for me, zero. But they had only purchased 20 bucks, and those were returnable. So I'm thinking, so I call back. Here's where it begins. And I asked the publisher, can you get me on some radio or television shows? What for? Because no one's going to show up. But what if I talk about something they actually need, like help with their pain, fatigue? Okay. And they got me on some shows. So I said, not to come and get a signed book. I said, I'm willing to give advice and I'll take it whatever time it takes to help you personally to see if we can overcome your diabetes, your pain, etc. And suddenly a lot of people showed up at my next stop in Washington, D.C. I was at the Hicks department store and they had like 200 people show up. In fact, they said that nobody gets 200 people, but they bought books and sold out, and then went in, they extended into uh, Atlanta, and so they just kept going. I just was on the road, and each one got bigger and bigger. Finally, I came back to the city because I had no clothes, except for what I was wearing. I'd be in a hotel at night, <laughs> washing out my clothes and hanging them up to dry. Um, my publisher was very tight with money. <clears throat> didn't put me in a nice hotel. In any case, I saw the people really wanted help. And the way you help them is show that there's, there's, there's something realistic that can make a difference in their lives. So we came back and we reformulated. I went on another tour, and this time, the, the amount of media I got was phenomenal. Like in Toronto, I had 22 media appearances. I was nonstop, in fact, I said, there's no time for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Just, uh, I asked the driver, here's some money. Would you go to the cell food store and buy this stuff for me? And so I'd eat in between running from point A to point B, an interview, television interview, overnight, the longer interviews. And we sold a lot of books. My last stop was during a thunder, a, 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 a ter terrible snowstorm in uh, Minneapolis. And I didn't think anyone was going to come in the book manager was kind of angry. He says, your publisher said no returns. And he said, this great success you're having. And so I, I was forced to buy 1,200 books non-refundable. And look at it. It's snowing out. We're not going to get five people. Well, we did. We sold over 900 books. The most he's ever sold by any author in the store's history for a personal showing. 
he was so angry. He said, I still got all these books. When you leave, they're not going to be sold. <clears throat> I said, I will guarantee that you'll be refunded. Return them. And if I have to pay for it out of my own royalties, you will lose nothing. Okay. So I got back to the city. And the publisher and I had a conversation about greed. And I just, I put it on him. I said, I'm not going to do any more books for you. That's it. I never got a royalty, by the way. They sold over 1.2 million books in hardback. I should have made about $2 million. I made nothing, not a penny. And I know how many books sold because on a Saturday I went down to meet with the publisher. The publisher didn't show up, but the bookkeeper was there. And they were just had all these cases of my books going out. And she said, man, I'm working an extra day a week just to get your books out. How many you get? Well, 1.2 million we've sold in hardback. Okay. Again, I didn't benefit at all. I made this guy rich. And so I'm thinking, what's wrong? I can't work any harder. I'm, I'm doing everything that a human being can do. Here comes the five, the five points of harmony. I did not have the right support system. It was a good time. I was in the right place, New York City. I had the right idea, give people information that can really help them. Don't make it about you. Everyone else that was on the show, it's their egos. You know, it's all about them and this red carpet and their new movie and their new television series. I'd never made it about me. It was about how can I help you? So I had two of the five essential things missing. Here are the five things. One, have the right idea. Two, be in the right place. Three, make it the right time. Four, have the right support system. And five, be the right person. If any one of those five are not harmonizing, you'll fail at everything. As you might remember, I mentioned the dangers of success if that success imbalances you. You can be successful, but stay, stay in balance. It's just the success has to be bridled. You have to hold back success because you can burn out. You can burn out from anything if you can't pull back. If you become addicted to being appreciated, loved, making money, buying things, being overly responsible for people you shouldn't be responsible for, you think you're doing the right thing, but it's out of balance. As a result, Something has to give. You'll lose something for everything you gain if you're not living in balance. So in any case, the next time that we sold the paperback rights, I ended up with one of the best editors in America, Dell Books. We sold millions and millions of copies. And uh, why? Because they were the right support system. I could go in, I could sit down any day of the week and talk. Uh, we could plan together uh, what made the books original. I did a whole series. I had my own imprint. I did seven books in a row, all bestsellers. Because these people are, they're in cocoons, the editors. They're not out in the real world. I was. And as a result, I knew what people were telling me were their problems. So I simply said, I'm not going to write anything about me, my needs. I'm fine. I want to write books that help people with their problems. And she agreed. And uh, so that began the understanding of you've got to have a good support system. you got to be in the right place at the right time. And you have to be confident in yourself so you can flow. No, well... I'm not so sure. I'm not that smart. I'm not that gifted. Blah, blah. The moment you self start self-depreciating, it's as bad as over, over promoting yourself. The egotist, the narcissist, the entitled person. No, go to neither end of the spectrum. Just be confident in yourself and keep raising the bar. Once you've achieved something, raise the bar. Do it even better the next time. Keep the idea that we're not perfect, but we're going to be better than what we were. 
Now, let me give you a real good example of this. And I didn't have that concept of the five principles, but this happened after I was invited on a Friday afternoon. I get a call. This guy said, no, I said, yeah, uh, this is Bob Marty down at um, Empire Productions. And we want to have you fill in for someone who canceled in a debate tonight on national PBS. Okay. Don't you want to know who you're debating? Doesn't matter. If you think that I can contribute to the debate, that's all that counts. I can't be concerned about what someone else knows. I have to be concerned about what I know. Okay, well, you got two hours. So I, you know, got on a suit and went downtown and met the, it turns out I debated Josh and Elders, the Surgeon General of the United States. And uh, it was a good debate. Why? Because I chose not to take advantage of what she didn't know. And she didn't know a lot on the topics that we were discussing. Instead, and you would have to watch the film for yourself, I would come in and, and say, I'll give you an example about hormone replacement therapy. As we know, it increases the risk by 13% of a heart attack, strokes, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colorectal cancer, and dementia. But the natural hormone replacements with Dong Kwai and Fo Tai and Passion Vine and Viac, Vitex, and uh, they really rebalance the body, rebalance estrogen, progesterone levels without harming you. So you have hormone replacement therapy that's synthetic and natural. The natural is good, the synthetic is not. And so I, I answered in an affirmative that we're very it's good that we have someone like uh, our Surgeon General who is both a woman and caring about other women's issues. And it was just interesting that I took with me this huge book on women's health that I just finished writing with one of the world's greatest feminists, Barbara Seaman. We were close friends. We did this 1,600-page book called For Women Only. And I gave it to her as a gift, and she was very grateful. She was a very, very nice person. But what was important is when I'm going out to go home, uh, this guy says, hey, no. And I look back and here's this kind of long-haired guy sticking his head out the door saying, you did right. I didn't know what that meant. But about three weeks later, I get a call. Hey, no. Yeah. This is Bob Marty. Want to do a program on women's health? No. Why not? Be on a PBS station down in Miami. I said, because there's so many people better than me, including Dr. Northrup and many other, uh, Cheryl Selman, who, because they are women and have experienced conditions themselves, I believe that it is better for them to tell the story of natural and non-toxic approaches. Okay, well, that's the first, turning down a chance to be on PBS. I said, I can name you a lot of people who would be better served in that position than me. Instead of hanging up, he says, well, what would you like to talk about? And I said, something nobody talks about. What's that? Aging, getting old, dying prematurely. Hmm. You sure there's anybody interested in that? I said, everybody is interested once they start to age. When the gray hairs come, the wrinkles come, the loss of libido happens, the skin begins to thin, the jowiness in the face, the fat hanging off the arms, not having the muscle mass you had at one time in your life, not looking in the mirror uh, at the same body you looked at 20 years ago or five years ago. I said, yes, they just don't talk about it. Okay, so he took three days. He said it would take three days at the Chelsea studios to film this. I said, no, it'll take an hour. He said, that's not possible. I'm the number one producer in PBS history. I said, I've heard your name. I've seen some of your programs. You do outstanding work, but I know me. You don't. It took an hour. I had my radio audience there, and it, the program was called How to Live Forever. That was just a metaphor. And we took it down to Miami. And when I got off the uh, plane and the man 
met me. He was a stage manager. He says, well, driving back, he says, I want to apologize because it's a Sunday afternoon. It's not in prime time. Um, Dan Marino is playing with the Dolphins and everyone else at the beach, so we're not going to have much of an audience. I said, uh, what would I have to earn for you to get invited back? He said, well, if you earn us $1,000, I'll be happy. You'll get an invite back. And he talked about Burt Backrack had been there the night before in prime time and, and did well. And uh, so I went in the studio and the building's empty. There's just one camera guy, two older women sitting on a little table with each with a telephone. And he went up to his office. He said, I'll see you at the, oh, when it's over. And it works this way. I didn't even have a premium. I didn't have anything to sell. Um, so I took an, the, 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 uh, VHS. They, we didn't even have DVDs then, 1998. And uh, so I offered that and another book I had, The Complete Encyclopedia of Natural Healing. In any case, I'm reading the teleprompter and it's just that corny stuff. And, uh, well, support your local station because, well, everybody knows why they're supporting their non-commercial radio or television station. You don't have to remind them. So I said to the camera operator, can I just wing it? He said, well, no one's here, you know, and it's, no one's going to pay attention. Do what you want to do. So I did. You play the, what we'd already pre-recorded in front of a live audience. You play 15 minutes that, then you do a 10 minute pitch, 15 minutes of the show, 10 minute pitch, 15 minutes of the show, 10 minute pitch. So you're pitching for a half hour. So I did. And I saw the phone ringing and uh, I thought, well, okay, maybe we'll reach a thousand dollars. So the next, he says, how'd you do? I said, I think I did all right. I'm not sure. So he says, okay, I'll pick you up at six o'clock in the morning, drive you to the airport, fly you back to New York. Okay. So in the morning, I'm downstairs and uh, he pulls up. He says, well, I got good news and bad news. I said, what's the bad news? He says, you're not going back home. I said, why? He said, well, you didn't raise $1,000. You raised over $136,000, the most anyone's ever raised in our station's history in a single showing. More than Yanni and Three Tenors and Riverdale. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we have a network that communicates. We have a five-tier. Zero, you don't get invited back. One, you don't get invited back. Two, you might get invited back if there's no one else better than you. Three, you'll get invited back. Four, you're a hit. And five, you knock the socks off everyone. And you were five plus plus. Okay. I didn't bring any clothes. So he said, but stop off. So we stopped off and I got socks and underwear, things you need, and a couple of shirts. And I didn't even get out of Florida for a week. They had me in from there to West Palm Beach and from West Palm Beach. Uh, then over to up to uh, Orlando and from Orlando over uh, to, uh, I think it was, uh, let's say Fort Myers. Yeah. So I did all that and then clear up the East Coast. I was exhausted. But in every situation, I set a record that had never been done before in PBS history for fundraising. And then I got back and everyone was very happy. And I went out on three more tours. And uh, it was interesting because in Boston, I was supposed to finish up by eight o'clock and be on a, the last flight, a shuttle back to New York. But um, I said, we have all these phone calls coming in for me. Why don't I just spend the night at a desk answering people's questions? And then in the morning, take me out to uh, Amtrak and I'll take that first plane, uh, train back. They said, okay. You know, nobody volunteers to stay and answer people's questions, but hey, you're going to do it. Good. Because you set a record. Next morning, I walk out. Now, this is part of the story. I walk out and the producer, nice person, says, well, the audience loved it. We were flooded with positive responses. But there are people who didn't like it, and these people are powerful. Well, you can guess which people didn't like it. 
who are powerful, who do the advertising. And she said, so I can't have you back. I apologize for that, but this is the politics, and you're going to meet this elsewhere too. And so I got back and I had a strategy meeting. I said, then let's do two more immediately. And Bob Marty, heck of a nice guy, brilliant guy. Um, he says, well, normally you wouldn't do but one special every two years or so. And you want to do three back to back to back? It's never been done. I said, fine. But you've never had a special you've done that broke every record in every PBS station in the United States. So, trust my intuition. He did. Our next show, which introduced Dr. Oz for the first time, a whole panel of doctors called Get Healthy Now. The third special was for women only. And all were blockbuster monster hits. I remember, to give you an example, I was running around Central Park. Uh, this The day after, I, I premiered on a Saturday night in New York at, at uh, a New York PBS station. And the next morning, I'm running in the park, and all these runners say, Hey, Gary, saw you last night at PBS, saw you last night at PBS. And, you know, high fying Because I'm part of the runners community, I, I won uh, Master Track and Field Athlete of the Year uh, several times, and indoor uh, champion one year. That's That was a tough competition, 10 races, number one. And I'd set multiple records. I, I haven't lost a race in 32 years, not because I'm a better athlete, because I, I train differently and I race differently. In any case, that's not the issue. The issue was there's kind of like an informal community of people who nod of a head, thumbs up, you know, and they're in the races that they're there, you can do it, you know, kind of that kind of thing. Not people I hang out with, but athletic friends. A week later, it's Gary, what do you pay them to get on every day, all day? And I said, what are you talking about? They says, you're on constantly on PBS. I thought, really? By the second week, I had people saying, Gary, tell them to take you off the air. You're on too much. So I called the president of Channel 13 I, and, and Bob Martin. I said, why am I on constantly? They said, because you're raising a ton of money. I said, but I'm on too much. People are complaining I'm on too much. He says, let them complain because you're doing what's never been done in our history before. Okay. What is the moral of this story? Here's where the five principles come in. And I didn't understand at the time. This only happened about two years ago. And we're talking about something that was, you know, almost, well, it was, uh, let's say, 22, almost 30 years ago. I was in the right place, New York City. At the right time, I got the right idea doing something on aging when nobody wanted to do it, no one had done it. I had the right support team. Bob Marty, the most successful, powerful, intelligent, dynamic producer in PBS history. I don't know the number he's done now, uh, but at that time, I think it was 1,200 specials. Victor Borgi and all these others. But most importantly, it was I was the right person. Why? None of this would have happened. I would have never been on PBS had I not been kind and thoughtful to the and saw some weaknesses that I chose not to make that interview something about I beat this person, I won the debate. It was about let's discuss this together and share in whatever positive comes from it. That's why he stuck his head out and said, You did right. Now, if I didn't come from a more spiritual place, I would have thought, I can win. I'm going to defeat this person. I'm going to make him, I'm going to make this an intellectual blood sport. I'm going to make her look stupid. But I chose not to. First of all, because she's not a stupid person. She's a very decent person, very kind person, very ethical person. Instead, I show, chose to cooperate in a debate, not compete. Today, everything is a blood sport by various tribes. I'm sure that you're aware now of the latest reality show where people smack each other. One, two, 
three, boom. People could have a concussion. People could have an aneurysm. You could create a blood clot. You could break a jaw. You could dislocate the eye out of the eye socket. You could uh, crush their teeth. You could break their neck. For what? For what? What has happened to us as human beings? They were now living almost a primordial existence. <clears throat> because... On the hedonic scale, hedonism, which is pleasure, we have lived for centuries at the low end of that. Low meaning at the base end, meaning you find pleasures in the simple things of life. Looking into the eyes of someone that has chosen to be in your life for as long as that's possible. Watching your children grow and go through all their different temper tantrums and metaphors quizzes and questions and curiosities and knowing that you're there to guide them. Having friends that have got your back, even people who may not have enough for themselves, but if you said, hey, I've got a problem, what do you need? They'll share some of theirs with you. Knowing that people like you for who you are, not for how they can make you over and who they need you to be in order to tolerate you. People who you can find joy with, having a roof over your head. My family was happy to have a roof over her head, food on the table, clothes on her back. We cared about each other. Family was important. Community was important, honoring our community. That's where our values came from. That's where our understanding of the world, some of the best and worst of the concepts came from that. It wasn't perfect. But growing up, you at least had a chance through critical thinking and life experience to see this I'm going to let go of because it's not good and this I'm going to bring in because it is good. We're not, no one is given all the best perfect uh, teachings in life. We all have limitations, including our loved ones. And also, what did they go through? My parents went through the Great Depression. I'm sure some of your parents or grandparents went through the Great Depression. There was privations. They didn't have a lot. Then World War II, my mother, my father, uncles, aunts all went into the war. And uh, my mother was a uh, one of these women, uh, Rosie the Riveter, you know, that you see the old ads, you know, with the bandana hat and working in the arms industry. And they get a little coupon book and stamps. They can get gasoline and eggs, et cetera. So they appreciated everything. They took nothing for granted. They developed skills that they could do something for themselves instead of always having someone else come and fix something for them. So if there was a plumbing issue or carpenter issue, someone in the family could fix it. If not immediately, then aunts and uncles. We were very, very capable. But that came from our ancestors who had to be because there was no, in the Great Depression, there was no social security. There was no welfare. I mean, people starved to death. In the Great Dust Bowl, people died. So when you come from having strong uh, life impressions, not always good, those are ingrained into your epigenetics, the epa, larger environment, your genes. So your genes are directly responding to something that goes seven generations back. Now, once you're aware of that, you can then say, okay, I don't want to overreact to something and I don't want to underreact to it. I don't want to do something out of fear, insecurity, uncertainty, guilt, or shame. I don't want these to be bookends to keep me from doing the right thing when it's needed. If there's something wrong, I'm going to address it. I'm not going to allow all these little issues to culminate into a big issue and then feel overwhelmed and feel like a victim. And that's what the five harmonizing principles help you do. What is what wasn't working? Which one wasn't working? Then stop it. But only because that one single thing I did of cooperating with her, this wonderful human being, I cooperated with her instead of competing. So in our society, we become too competitive and not cooperative enough. And 
you have to look at your culture, you have to look at your background to see that's how you were formed in your consciousness of what's right and wrong today. Can you change your perception? If you can't change your perception, you will never change your reality. But I, Gary, I, it's what I feel. Okay, and what, what went into how you feel? How much of that is a reaction, subconscious reaction, something happened to you when you were three years old, and now you're acting like it's something real in this moment. It's not. So on the hedonic scale, people were able to live rather simply. They had quality of life. They just didn't have a big standard of living. But people didn't envy what they didn't have. There was this universal sense of appreciation. If you have joy, laughter, if you can all get at the dinner table together and talk through the issues of the day, if you can enjoy things together, going to a drive-in movie, remember those? The whole family took a basket of you know, fried chicken or whatever it was, and you enjoyed the movie. You did things together. You did things through your religions, whatever they were. You enjoyed your friendships at work. They were generally jobs you would have for the rest of your life. There were three jobs waiting for everyone in my generation when they got out of college. More jobs available than there were people to fill them. We had the best of America for the middle class, the working class, from 1945 to 1975, the best 30 years in our history, as far as real equality. Merit mattered. Character mattered. Honor, your word, mattered. Manners mattered. Uh, and your moral values mattered. Today, it still does in a lot of people, probably the majority, but they're the silent ones now. But then you've got a whole group of people who it wasn't enough. Got to have more. And so they push themselves. And you can see it on the hedonic scale, going from pleasure in the simple things of life to only pleasure when you're overstimulated, drugs, and then psychedelics, and magic mushrooms, and and then the swingers clubs and all this other stuff, we just kept going to such extremes and now smacking people. And you know that when you smack someone in a year from now, someone's going to say, well, let's fist hit them in the mouth and see who wins that. We won't stop because there's a group of people that believe that what they see on television, these reality shows is real. It's all fake. And that these are people that in some way we should be influenced in our own lives. We shouldn't. They're the worst examples of human beings. They have none of the virtues of decency and spirituality and morality and ethics. Everyone is wanting their 15 minutes of fame and they'll do anything, say anything to get it. It's out of balance. When you're not living your life in, in balance, then all you're doing is becoming a passive spectator to your own demise. You just don't know how long it'll take. Look at a nation that's morbidly obese. If we loved ourselves, would we be obese? No. If we cared about the choices we make, we'll be making all wrong choices? No. We'd be voting for the fools that we vote for now? No. We'd be working together as we once did to build our homes, our communities, our values, but we're not. Just the opposite. That's why I say we've crossed the Rubicon. So individuals will understand this and seek, seek to try even more ways of living an ethical, higher quality of life in balance. And hence all five harmonies. Right idea, the right time, the right place with the right support system, and be the right person. We've learned to be spectators to authorities that we're supposed to trust. And look what has happened from all the things we were told to trust. Believe me. And we did. And look at the consequences. It's changing. But I think we've lost some of a generation, the younger generation. They will have to go through the next 20, 25 years of life and all that's going to be happening in the world before they see that they're not entitled to all the things they thought they would be. And there's a real world. And if they're not really prepared for it, then we're going to see more suicides, more overdosing with fentanyl, more people who are depressed 
and anxious chronically, living with an angst that they can't understand because one of those five elements has been missing. Maybe the wrong support system. Maybe their parents were professionals and preoccupied with their careers and didn't see what was happening to them. So we have a new way of looking at life. I'm just sharing one of the new insights I've had. See if it makes sense to you. See if the things that have worked in your life were uh, just, it was easy. My life's like Fred Astaire dancing, smooth, especially with Eleanor Powell began the beginning. Watch that one. Or, oh man, you have no idea. I, I just, I've got so much, you know, and I can't contend with it. There's so many problems and, and so many conflicts. Only when we can be vulnerable enough to be honest with ourselves can we change. In the younger generation, they have a hard time acknowledging mistakes. They have a hard time listening. They have a hard time realizing the real world isn't a cocoon to which they can yell and scream and demean in a ratio if they don't like what you've said. Think about these things, please. And what I'm going to do is over the next several days, in fact, for the next two weeks, our classroom on the air will be taking on anger, taking on overcoming our dark side so our light side can excel, and be free and grow without fear or limitation. I'm going to, going to go into all these different issues that allow us to overcome addictive behavior. So now I'm going to get into specific areas. Hopefully you'll share those with other people because it's word of mouth that is the most important form of communication. All right? Every day at noon, on go to prn.live. That stands for Progressive Radio Network, prn.live at noon. Thank you all for taking your time. Hope you find something of value in it. If not, come back tomorrow. There'll be more to think about. Have a nice day. Are you tired of closed-minded programming? Well, look no further than prn.live, the home for progressive voices.